Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Ord, and welcome to my talk today on how to make your agents more productive. Let's get to work. Now, when you work in the contact center, there are two different categories of contacts coming in. And when I talk about categories, I'm not talking about why the customer is contacting you. I'm talking about how they're contacting you or the channel that they're using. So the first category here on the screen are those that need to be handled when they arrive. They need to be handled immediately. And generally, there's a queue involved. So can you stop and think, what are one or two channels where contacts need to be handled when they arrive? OK, great. So if you said phone, congratulations. And if you said live chat, congratulations. And if you said walk in, double congratulations. Because a customer that walks in or calls in or uses live chat has a reasonable expectation that their contact's going to be handled relatively quickly. Immediately doesn't mean zero seconds, but relatively quickly. Now, the second category of contacts that are coming in don't have to be handled when they arrive. They can be handled in work units, or they can be batched and processed over time. And generally, you have some kind of promised response right here. So can you think of one or two channels that can be handled later? Cool. So if you said email, congratulations. People don't handle email straight away. I've never seen agents standing at the keyboard going, I can hear, I can hear the email. Here it comes to the and then respond straight away. And the same with correspondence. People go to the post office or the post office delivers. They open the correspondence. They process the correspondence and so forth. So when you have two different categories, there are two different wait time metrics. So for the contacts that need to be handled when they arrive, we use service level, something I imagine you're all familiar with. And here's how it's expressed. X percent will be answered in Y seconds or minutes. And we'll talk about minutes in a moment. For the contacts that can be handled later, we use response time. And here's how it's expressed. We will handle 100% of our emails within two days. We will handle 100% of our correspondence within three days. We will handle 100% of serious complaints within four days. So there is a promised response time. Now, the question that comes up here is, how do I know which one to use? Well, fortunately, the queuing experts that do all this mathematics, they figured this out for us. If you're going to handle a customer contact within 60 minutes or less, it's considered to be immediate. If you're going to handle it within 60 minutes or more, it's considered to be not immediate. Now, in Contact Center, we all get used to this, I'm going to handle 80% of calls in 30 seconds, and I'm going to handle 90% of calls in 10 seconds. So when they hear minutes, they're like, minutes, really? But stop and think about walk-ins. If you walk into a bank branch, and I know that's happening less and less, but it's still there, you can't serve people in 20 seconds. So they might set a KPI or a metric that says, we will serve 70% of walk-in customers within 20 minutes. And oftentimes when you go into, let's say the mobile phone shop, you actually take a queue number where your number is flashing up on a board. And that's a system that also tracks how well the mobile phone shop meets their service level objectives here. So up to about the 60 minute mark, it's immediate. After the 60 minute mark, it's not immediate. So I have a short little quiz for you here. Take a moment, look at the screen, and where the gray boxes are, would you fill in service level for this contact type or category, or would you fill in response time? Take a second. And I'm sure you've all done a great job here. Phone calls are always service level. Um, emails here it says with a three hour response time so that metric would be response time based live chat is always service level driven whatsapp isn't that's different but live chat is service level driven and walk-in customers are always service level driven now why do i start our talk today on productivity with this well it's really important this is fundamental operations the way you calculate the number of staff you need and the productivity metrics you set for agents are completely different 
between service level based environments and response time and based or based environments. So whenever you're talking about productivity, you need to be super clear about which environment you're talking about. Are you talking about your dedicated email team over here? Or are you talking about your live chat and phone and video conference people over here? Now, if you're working in a true omni-channel environment, things get a little bit more complex, more complex than we talked about today, but this fundamental understanding of service level versus response time still applies even in omni-channel environments. It's just a bit more calculation involved. Now, what do I think everyone wants from their contact center agents? I think it, the simpler, the better. I call it PQ&A. I want my agent's productivity, of course, we have to define that. I want my agent's quality. Of course, we have to define that too. And I want and need my agent's attitudes, the right attitudes for success, which is very much an employee engagement and people management topic. We don't do much with it today, but it's still really important. So again, P, Q, and A, our focus today is obviously on the productivity side. Now, whatever you hear contact center people talk about productivity, they're often talking about how many or how fast, but do keep in mind that this constant conversation on how many or how fast is very much industrial revolution based. Um, it's very primitive. Some people still look at call centers like they're factories when the reality is they're not. So let's dig a bit deeper into this. There are definitely wrong ways to measure agent productivity and wrong ways that are still out there. And I want to cover three of those with you now. So here's a list of three common ways to incorrectly measure or target agent productivity. The first one is number of calls handled. Now, number of calls handled has always been wrong. It has always been wrong. And I'm actually still surprised there are centers out there that believe this is a valid way to measure and track agent productivity. Because the reality is in service-level-based uh, service environments, notice I've stressed that, there are mathematical realities at work that mean that agents don't control how many contacts are presented to them. And there's a really simple way to explain this. If you need 100 people on the phone to achieve a predefined service level, let's say it's 80-30, and you want them all to handle many calls, don't bring in 100, bring in 50. If you understaff, you will automatically raise the quantity handled by everyone. But that doesn't mean you're, that the agents are more productive, it means the management team doesn't know how to run a proper contact center. And I could go on and on with these examples, but this is operations 101. You don't target agents on number of contacts handled. It's incorrect, mathematically. Put aside the morality, mathematically it's wrong. The second one, occupancy rate. Occupancy is a fancy way of saying how busy was the agent when they were logged in to serve customers. But again, targeting agents on occupancy rate has always been wrong. Agents don't control how busy they are when they're logged in. This is again, operations 101. I guarantee you, if you are an agent working in a contact center where you're targeted either on number of contacts handled or occupancy rate or both, life is not very happy. And customers will tell you life is not very happy either. You risk many problems if you ignore fundamental operations. And let's take it down to the third one. Too much emphasis on the agent portion of average handling time. I do meet centers that seem to think agents are in control of most, if not in fact all of their average handling time, but that's simply not true. And it's so important that I actually want to spend a few minutes on this. So let's take a look at the next slide here. Now, let me explain what you're looking at. This is an excerpt from a model that I teach in full operations training. So we're not going to cover the entire model, but I'd like to explain it to you and then we'll drill into average handling time. Here on the far right hand side, you'll see a black box. It says actual service level. That is an outcome. That is your service level performance. Now, if you slide your eye over to the left, you'll notice there are three drivers of service level. There are only three things that make service level go up and go down, and there they are. And if you slide your eye even further to the left, what you're going to see is drivers of the driver. So it's understanding what makes this box go up or down or move, what makes this box go up or down or move. Now, for purposes of our talk today, 
I'd like to focus in very much on just the average handling time portion. So let me go to the next slide. What I've done here is I've broken out just the drivers of average handling time. And before we look at those drivers, let me explain the color coding because I think that also matters here. Yellow means the agent is responsible or in control of this. Green means it's a shared responsibility between the agents and the management. Blue means it's a responsibility or under the control of management. And this pinkish box means it's driven primarily by the customer so that you can kind of see who's responsible for what. Now let's go over to the left here. There's your outcome for actual average handling time. It's a result. And let's start from the bottom. Now you'll notice this first box I'm looking at at the bottom, management directives. It's blue because this all comes from management. So if management sets handling time goals, if they say, for example, I want your call to be about four minutes, agents will do what they can to make that call four minutes, right, wrong, possible or impossible, rude or not rude. People do pursue the KPIs that they're given by and large. If management asks you to do upselling or cross-selling that impacts agent average handling time. If management says, please add more value to customers at the end of every call, please remind customers they can use our mobile app to figure this out. That's obviously a management directive that impacts average handling time. And last but not least, if your agents are involved in inviting customers to participate in a survey, that also impacts the average handling time. And this is all blue. Now, let's go up to the second box here, technology. Last time I checked, management decides what technology to buy, not agents. And technology can help, meaning it reduces or optimizes AHT, or technology can hurt, meaning it stretches uh, AHT or makes it longer. Let me give a couple of quick examples. Do you ever have times of day where the system hangs? Well, if the system hangs, what's going to happen to AHT? It's going to go up, but that's because of the technology, not because of the agent. And I met a bank once where the, the agents had to open 13 different systems to serve a customer. So the bank was pretty smart. They realized if they could take these 13 systems and reduce it down to even eight or nine, they could improve or optimize the EHT a lot. Because the key learning is the biggest improvements in EHT, which most people take to mean shorter or lesser, is your process, improving the process, or improving the technology. It's not the agent. The third box up is primarily pink. The complexity of the call is driven by the customer, how much they know, how much they don't know. Um, our agents should be experts in our organization. I don't think we expect customers to be experts in the organization. They may need a bit of handholding to get through whatever their query or question is. Now, the last box is the focus for today, and you'll notice it's green. I want to point that out straight away, meaning it's a shared responsibility between the agent and management. And this is your agent KSA. It's a learning and development term. K stands for knowledge, S stands for skills, and A stands for abilities. I also put attitude here. So we want our agents to take what they learn in quality and combining their knowledge, their skills, and their abilities, we want them to deliver that appropriate level of quality that we've taught, that we've selected, and that we coach we want them to take that and apply that when they interact with customers. That's why this box is green, because management teaches it, agents apply it, and that's an outcome that then drive, or forgive me, that then is a input that drives the outcome for AHT. And you'll notice it's only one of the boxes that drives AHT, and you'll notice that none of the boxes here are yellow, meaning the agent is not fully in control of any of these. So it's completely incorrect to sit down and say, agents control most or all of their AHT. That's gonna drive your center in completely the wrong direction. Let's carry on here. So what do agents bring to AHT? Well, I've tried to sum it all up on one picture here. The first is their adherence to schedule. In service level based environments, and notice again, I'm bringing that up, when you've got the right number of people in the right place at the right time, your life is good. You're running an efficient center. Because if you're short by even one person, your service level is going to drop by a lot. It's called the power of one. And all your metrics go haywire. On the other hand, if you're overstaffed by even one person, you're wasting money. Because that one additional person on the phone doesn't bring you any significant wait time benefit. It's actually called the law of diminishing returns. And because Labor is the most important 
part or, or, or expensive part of running a contact center, we really have to make sure we don't overstaff because that's wasting resources. It's about having the right number of people in the right place at the right time. And agents contribute to this through adherence. So many of the centers I work with when they're coming up with their productivity formula for their agents, adherence to schedule is the biggest input. It has the highest weight. One, because agents control it, so it's within their personal control. And two, it has such a dramatic impact on the service level we're trying to achieve. Let's go to the second item. Agents deliver the right quality as defined and coached by management. And we just looked at that. This is the whole KSA piece. They apply their knowledge, skills, and abilities so that they can deliver the right level of quality. The third one, when we have cross-trained agents, especially across channels, it allows us a lot of flexibility in our center. If we have an agent that can move from live chat to email to, let's say, video chat, that makes our lives a lot easier when we've got these peaks and valleys and different channel volumes coming through. I have met agents in the past that are quite resistant to learning new channels. They like the phone. They like the email. They don't want to do the phone. But again, this ability to have an attitude that says, I want to learn more, I want to grow, I want to help my center improve, that has a lot of value and power in today's contact center. Now, at this point, some people, especially after I've done a number of calls handled and average handling time, people really raise their hands and get very red in the face and say, but Dan, we have to run a cost efficient center. We have to be cost efficient, otherwise my boss will let us go, et cetera. And this is what I point out, putting the right number of people in the right place at the right time continues to epitomize the cost efficient center. That's why these people in workforce management and forecasting and scheduling and staffing are so important because the decisions they make about where to put people when is the biggest driver by far of cost efficiency in the contact center. So when you're talking cost efficiency, start here, start with putting the right number of people in the right place at the right time. So what does management bring to productivity? I know the session is on agents, but what agents do and go through is so much driven by the management thinking. So let's take a look at how management contributes to productivity. The first thing is this. When I see contact center managers start to focus more on demand, and demand is all that customer stuff coming in. And they start looking at demand and they go, huh, what can we do to mitigate this demand, to reduce this demand? I like sometimes to use the word optimize this demand because, yeah, my agents are here, but if I could reduce demand, I could reduce the overall population. And that's honestly pretty strategic. Whereas other contact center managers, they're more focused on what I call squeezing supply supplier, your agents. And see this picture of the toothpaste? I have it there on purpose because these contact center managers do this. They squeeze their agents like they're tubes of toothpaste and they have to get the last little drop out of that toothpaste. And believe me, those places are terrible. To work there is awful. People aren't happy. Customers aren't happy. You're going to get a lot more results by thinking strategically and looking at how to reduce incoming demand not just focus exclusively on squeezing the supply. That's when you become a more strategic thinker and more beneficial to your center overall. Quality. Now, management defines quality. And take a look at this. A relentless focus on quality means customers who reached out to our center, because not all do. In some centers, less than 1% of the entire customer base actually use the center. But for those who do, we don't want them to have to keep coming back again and again and again because every contact costs money in some way. So if we have a relentless focus on quality, maybe we can solve the customer's issue at the get-go and solve any potential future issue as well in order to reduce the number of contacts that are coming in. And that comes through things like setting a service delivery vision or having a customer experience vision choosing performance standards that really matter. This day of saying the customer's name three times, I hope is finally over because that's what I call 1973 customer service. And that doesn't get us anywhere. We need to start setting standards 
and behaviors that matter to customers, that matter to employees, and make a difference in people's lives and gets them inspired. Quality is a big, big topic. And sometimes I actually say, and it could be a little bit risky saying this, I think quality is the new productivity. The better quality we give, the less contacts we get and the less repeat contacts we give when you stop and think about it. So quality really matters here. A subset of the quality discussion is this. Some people think the, the phrase first contact resolution is a bit old fashioned. I don't disagree. They sometimes say, what we should be talking about is next issue avoidance. Because first contact resolution means we solve the issue that's in front of us. So we solve the issue in front of us, ding, we get first call resolution. Even if the same customer calls us back a couple weeks later on something different, we solve that one and ding, we get first call resolution. Next avoidance, or forgive me, next issue avoidance looks like this. Hi guys, I did what the agent advised last week when I got that error message and it worked, thank you very much. Oh, but this week I've got another error message. Can you help me with this? Well, if the center did a bit of study, they might find this. Many customers who experience the first error message are likely to experience the second error message at some point. So rather than just waiting for them to contact us seven or 14 days later on the second error message, why don't we do next issue avoidance? Why don't we say, Mr. Orr, just to let you know, it's possible that you could get a second error message. Let me please explain that. And here's what you do and here's what it means, because I don't want you to have to go through the hassle of recontacting us again. Of course, we're always here for you, but I just don't want you to have to. And I love this idea of looking downstream. I think we don't do that enough in contact centers and say what's going to happen next in the customer's journey. How, we can, how can we contribute not to just this step or touch on the journey? How, how can we contribute to that journey going much further down the road? And that's the power of next issue avoidance. I think it's very powerful. Now, one of the last things I want to talk about here is customer experience. Now, let me let you take a look at this. Understanding why customers reach out to the center in the first place and fixing that. Because in the contact center, we sometimes don't have control over why customers are reaching us. They're reaching out to us because they don't understand the instructions they got. They're reaching out to us because they don't understand how to read the bill or they think they've been overcharged. Some contact center people like to rebrand themselves as customer experience people, but I think that does a, does a disservice to both industries because contact center people are not customer experience people. The, the, the focus is different. The job is different. The responsibilities are different. Of course, they have to work together, but look at the playing field. Contact centers tend to play in the customer service space. And of course, they voice things out to the organization, but they may not have the authority or the bandwidth to actually make changes within, within the organization. Whereas customer experience by definition crosses the entire organization, including partners and suppliers and contract people and so on. So yes, there's a tight relationship between the two, but what I always recommend contact center people do is go and learn customer experience. Go and really learn what it is, how it works, what are the disciplines involved, what are the, the practices that work, and then see how you can contribute to that. I think that's a much more powerful way to work in customer experience. And let's just sum up the agent job here in one slide. It's always been my favorite definition. The job of a contact center agent is doing the right things at the right time. Doing the right things is your quality piece, is defined and measured and coached by you. And at the right time, interestingly enough, is, you got it, adherence to schedule. With that said, I hope you enjoyed today's talk. Um, I have all my contact information for you here, and I want to appreciate your attention and your time. I wish I could be with you in person in London, but hey, this is live today, and here we are. So thank you, and talk soon. Bye.